Welcome back to WrestleSpective, your favorite place for the obscure, forgotten, and defunct of professional wrestling. Vince McMahon is a name synonymous with professional wrestling, but being known for this one thing wasn't his initial goal. Wrestling was his father's business. Vince had plans to take it over, but he also wanted out from his dad's shadow. So Vince tried and tried to make his name in other parts of the entertainment space. These ventures included arena ownership, a stunt show, and in professional sports. And no, I don't mean the XFL. This is the story of Vince McMahon and his early career failures. Just at the start, in my opinion, Vince McMahon is a monster. He sucks. He's a terrible, dishonest, vile human being. But he's also an endlessly fascinating weirdo. He and WWE have built this myth about how he took wrestling out of smoke-filled bingo halls and into the mainstream. While there's a small kernel of truth to that myth, the story of Vince McMahon is riddled with as much controversy and failure as there is gumption and success. Last time out in my Vince Fitness Failures video, I mentioned that McMahon never wanted to be in the wrestling business. But it's probably more factually accurate to say that he didn't want to be known as the wrestling guy. It could be in the portfolio, but it wouldn't be the centerpiece of the empire he envisioned for himself. He didn't want to be known as a wrestling promoter. And he failed repeatedly from the very beginning to do anything but wrestling. Vince started his promoting career in 1973 running the state of Maine for his dad's WWWF. Vince Sr. gave him the opportunity pretty much just to shut him up. Vince kept asking for opportunities to get involved with the business aside from setting up the ring and being the announcer. The Elder McMahon's reasoning being that if Junior couldn't make it work in Maine, that'd be the end of the discussion. But Junior did make it work, supposedly tripling attendance. As Vince tells the story, he would occasionally don a mask and wrestle on these cards in the Pine Tree State. I've yet to be able to confirm that from any wrestler interviews. So if you know of any, please let me know in the comments. Vince obviously had a knack for drawing crowds, but he himself was only making about 50 to 100 bucks a night. So he quickly looked to expand outside of the squared circle. In 1974, Vince got into contact with New York prosecutor turned boxing promoter Bob Arum about an idea that he had. A crazy idea, but Arum was willing to listen. Evil Knievel was going to jump the Grand Canyon, and they were going to promote it and air it live via closed circuit television. Arum had become a big name in the promotional world for putting together over a dozen Muhammad Ali fights from the late 60s through the 1970s but he'd never put something like this together. Evil Knievel became an icon of the 1970s with his televised stunts jumping an ever-increasing amount of cars and trucks. My personal favorite is his jump from April of 1972. He jumped two vans and a hundred rattlesnakes. By the mid-1970s, Evil Mania was running wild, brother. There were shirts, puzzles, posters, stickers, lunch boxes, and of course, toys like the Evil Knievel stunt cycle. Vince had heard Knievel say that it was his dream to jump the canyon. And Vince was dead set on making that dream a reality. McMahon made phone call after phone call until he eventually got the man himself on the line. Next thing you know, Vince was maxing out his credit cards to book a flight to Las Vegas to meet in person. After a couple of cocktails, McMahon and Knievel had a deal. Vince was able to land the deal with Knievel by highlighting his family's relationship with over 130 closed circuit locations on the East Coast, and their connections to hundreds of others throughout the country. Closed circuit had been used for boxing going back to 1948 in Joe Lewis, it had also been used for some wrestling. It was a common way for a lot of people to see a big event live in their town that wasn't available on television. You go to your local theater or arena, pay 10, 20 bucks or whatever, and you can see it live. But as far as I can tell, nothing like this had aired via closed circuit. Promoters had shown a lot of events on closed circuit, but not a man launching himself across a gorge. Typically, Knievel's jumps were shown weeks later on ABC's Wide World of Sports. 
If McMahon did this right, the jump could be the biggest live audience Knievel had ever had. Vince's job was to get Knievel on board and set up all the various closed circuit locations throughout the country. Arum worked his connections at ABC to make sure the jump was rebroadcast a week later. Prior to the event, the location was changed. The Grand Canyon is federal land, and the US government said, I think the fuck not. You're not jumping over and potentially dying at the Grand Canyon. So, they moved the jump to Snake River Canyon in Idaho, since it's privately owned. But it's still a mile-wide hold that you're jumping over. Still an insane thing to do. Okay, Vince got out of trouble with the feds. Time to roll camera and rake in the dough. Except the event was a dud. The majority of the closed circuit locations were only half full or less. The reason Bob Arum believes it failed was that Vince and his team had made the jump seem too dangerous in the advertising. Scaring off the moms of Knievel's young fans. Most parents were not going to take their child to see their idol potentially die live in a theater. With the jumps on ABC, parents had some peace of mind that even if Knievel got seriously hurt, they wouldn't have aired it if he died. And the people that did turn out at the closed circuit locations didn't even get the spectacle they anticipated. Knievel had last minute concerns that his rocket wouldn't be able to make the jump after all. So he quickly deployed his parachute and floated harmlessly to the bottom of the canyon. Part of his draw was that maybe he makes the jump. Or he crashes and cheats death. So they didn't even get the big kaboom and thumbs up when he survives. Knievel only got paid $250,000 of his expected $6 million haul. And $250,000 is probably what Vince lost in the closed circuit costs anyway. Maybe more. This outing didn't exactly go as planned, but Bob Arum wasn't done with the younger McMahon yet. In 1976, Vince was approached by Arum to again head up promoting another closed circuit event. This time it was the soon-to-be infamous Antonio Noki vs. Muhammad Ali wrestler vs. boxer contest scheduled for June of that year. Arum knew boxing, but nothing about wrestling. And it was Vince who pitched the build-up to the fight and to have the event feature six other wrestler-boxer contests from different stadiums across the country. Like Chuck Wepner vs. Andre the Giant from Shea Stadium. Ali was hesitant to lose to Inoki as had been pitched by the Japanese great. So Vince laid out a grand plan where in the end, it appears to American audiences that Ali was cheated. Ali would have the advantage in the early rounds, then in the fifth round, Enoki would retrieve a razor blade hidden in his mouth and slice his forehead. Ali seeing this crimson mask and being a great sportsman would beg the referee to end the fight. And while his back was turned, Enoki would hit Ali with an insiguri, getting the win in despicable fashion. Ali loved this story McMahon had come up with. Ali was a huge wrestling fan and understood what the business was. He even used wrestling tactics like taunting his opponents and wearing all white to build the reactions of his crowds. Muhammad Ali was in. Problem was, when Ali landed in Tokyo and tried to ask about this plan that had been given to him, no one knew what he was talking about. I don't mean there was a language barrier, I mean no one on the New Japan side had been told any of this. After some rule changes back and forth, it was decided they would just have a shoot match with many restrictions. These restrictions in the rules really limited the action that could take place. The fight just ended up being Inoki kicking Ali's legs, which caused blood clots that many believe shortened his career. This cross-sport spectacular again bombed on closed circuit across the country, though not as badly as the last one. But it was still a money loser. Jim Ross is of the belief that the event didn't draw because in those pre-internet, pre-widespread cable territory days, Nobody knew who Anoki was. It lacked mass appeal. I tend to agree with that observation. After all, JR did purchase the closed circuit rights for Tulsa and Oklahoma City. So he would know. In fact, I'll let him explain exactly how poorly the event did for him. I invested, I, I mortgaged my home on this fight that Ali and Anoki uh, would draw money and I would come out on the how did you do? In 1976, the, the joint was probably worth I, 40 grand. I actually uh, lost money and had to 
borrow more money to pay off the first loan and then catch up with the mortgage in my house. If JR made out that badly, imagine how much Vince must have lost at the 100 or so locations that he promoted. The failure of this event ensured the rumored Ali versus Bruno San Martino fight in New York City 100% did not happen. The following year, in 1977, Vince fell behind on his taxes, with the IRS putting a lien on the Young family's home. Vince needed to get away from these expensive, one-off events that clearly weren't going to make him a mint. He needed something stable, something that could allow for consistent income, even if it wasn't a lot of money at once. In 1979, that opportunity presented itself. The owner of the Cape Cod Coliseum, Ed Fruin, was looking to get out of the live promoting business. So McMahon decided to dive in and purchase the Coliseum from Fruin. The deal was allegedly that Fruin would hold the mortgage, but Vince would make the payments to him to pay it off. And once the mortgage was paid off, Vince would fully own the Coliseum. Of course, Vince would use the profits from the Coliseum to pay off the purchase. The Cape Cod Coliseum was opened by Yarmouth real estate agent William Harrison in September 1972. Harrison opened the venue hoping to attract various touring entities to the Cape. If you're not from the Northeast, then you may not know about Cape Cod. It's the little arm of Massachusetts, right here. It's a very popular summer vacation spot for New Englanders. And not just places like Martha's Vineyard where you may see a celebrity or two, but towns all over like Brewster, Dennis, Chatham, and Hyannis, see massive population increases in the summer months, and that gives a huge boost to the local businesses. As an aside, if you've never seen a Cape League baseball game, I highly suggest it if you're ever in the area in the summer. It's a lot of fun and tons of future major leaguers pass through. Good times. Or just watch the 2001 classic Freddie Prinze Jr. film Summer Catch. Or not, I ain't your mama. Although Cape Cod has a smaller population, the Coliseum's central location in South Yarmouth ensured that a trip to the arena would be convenient for the majority of the area. Throughout the 1970s, the venue hosted boxing, semi-pro hockey with the Cape Cod Cubs, high school sporting events, and even the Boston Lobsters tennis team, which at the time was owned by Robert Kraft, the future owner of the New England Patriots. But the venue's biggest moneymaker was its concerts. Major bands like Kiss, Rush, and Van Halen, and Boston acts like Aerosmith and the Cars. The Coliseum was also a stop for WWWF events as the McMahons had a home in the Yarmouth area. In 1976, Harrison went bankrupt and sold the Coliseum to Ed Fruin, which would lead to the sale to Vince. In 1980, following McMahon's purchase of the Coliseum, Vince and Linda founded Titan Sports Inc., using the Coliseum as their home base. Vince and Linda poured every ounce of energy they had into making sure the Coliseum was a success. We did 20 ticks, and that was the best one. They continued hosting acts that had proven to work, but they also brought in new events. The most successful of these being an NHL preseason game in October of 1980 that saw the Boston Bruins beat the New York Rangers 4-3. Vince was able to lure the game to the Cape by promising the Boston Bruins a $50,000 ticket guarantee. They were able to pull that off by selling VIP tickets that came with extras, like a plate of meatballs Linda had made at home. The gamble paid off and may have influenced Vince on pursuing his next venture. In July 1981, the Eastern Hockey League folded, but reorganized as the Atlantic Coast Hockey League. The league wanted to add a team or two in between New York and Baltimore. After some bids failed, they looked to Massachusetts. Several investors dropped out, and eventually Vince was approached by a gentleman named Fraser Gleason. Gleason desperately wanted an ACHL franchise and Vince had tried and failed to bring an American Hockey League team to South Yarmouth earlier in the year. So, they partnered up to bring a pro hockey team to Cape Cod. The Cape Cod Buccaneers were born. After working together to build the team, McMahon discovered that Gleason actually didn't have the funds to be able to support the team. So, Vince bought the full rights to the franchise for $15,000. The ACHL started the 1981-82 season with seven teams. 
the Salem Raiders in Virginia, the Winston-Salem Thunderbirds out of North Carolina, the Mohawk Valley Stars from Utica, New York, the Baltimore Skipjacks out of Maryland, the Cape Cod Buccaneers in South Yarmouth, the Fitchburg Trappers also in Massachusetts, and the Schenectady Chiefs also in New York. Vince had gripes with the league from the very beginning. Two of the teams, Fitchburg and Schenectady, were owned by the same guy. That kind of conflict of interest didn't sit right with Vince, and both teams would fold during the season. In January 1982, as the league was trying to navigate a rough inaugural season, Vince allegedly requested a $15,000 loan from the league. His supposed reasoning was low cash due to low ticket sales. The loan was denied. As the season continued into February, the Winston-Salem franchise announced they would have to also fold unless the season ended early. The league decided to wrap up the season and hold the playoffs right away. Vince was strongly against ending the season early, feeling it would compromise the legitimacy of the league. The rest of the ACHL disagreed and proceeded with the playoffs. So, in protest, Vince folded the Buccaneers. After playing 39 games, the Bucks finished with a 17-21 and record. In March 1982, the Mohawk Valley Stars defeated the Salem Raiders to win the first ACHL championship. The league would continue for another five seasons, calling it quits in 1988. A few months after dropping out of the ACHL, in June 1982, Vince McMahon purchased controlling interest in the WWF from his dad and his partners. The deal was structured very similar to the deal that allowed him to buy the Cape Cod Coliseum, an agreement that allowed him to make his balloon payment with profits from the WWF. And the rest, as they say, is history. On June 4, 1984, the final event held at the Cape Cod Coliseum took place. Fittingly enough, it was a WWF house show. Not long after, Vince would sell the arena to the Christmas tree shop and move Titan's operations to Stamford. A building that is now up for sale. That's right, you, you can own Titan Tower. If you're from New England, I know you have some memories of trips to the Christmas tree shop. And if you don't, then I'm sure you at least remember the commercials. Don't you just love a party? That'll be stuck in your head for the next three weeks. You're welcome. There was a long-time urban legend going around that before he sold the Cape Cod Coliseum, McMahon actually offered to sell it to the town of Yarmouth for just one dollar. As long as they renamed it the Vince McMahon Memorial Coliseum. As the legend tells it, the town refused. So McMahon sold it to Christmas tree shops for much more than a buck. And then he used that money to fund the first WrestleMania. I'm kidding, but wouldn't it be great if that happened? Christmas tree shops would keep the Coliseum as their main offices until 2007 when they moved to Middleborough, Massachusetts. The building still stands today and houses multiple businesses. And that's the story of Vince McMahon's early forays into event promoting. If you're a regular viewer of the channel, I thank you for your support and for letting me squeeze in the surprise video. I had planned to do this topic in early 2025, but decided to get it out before the Netflix show starts. I doubt we'll get anything about these failures, but at least now you'll know about it. Alright, back to the grind of the already advertised content. See you for the next DCW World Wrestling All-Stars. As always, leave any thoughts or suggestions in the comments. I'm Scott from WrestleSpective. Watch wrestling. Love wrestling. Thanks for watching. Ribbon. Bargain, bargain, bargain. 500 yards of ribbon. One ninety.